Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Downing College and to the Axon Johnson Centre for the Study of Classical Architecture. My name is Frank Salmon. I'm the director of the centre here at Downing, and uh, you are joining us for our second academic year and for our, our third sequence of research seminars. And a very warm welcome to anybody who's joining us online as well for this occasion today. <clears throat> So next week, uh, we have uh, Lena Lambrino, who's coming from the Acropolis Restoration team to talk to us about the Parthenon. So I do hope many of you will have the opportunity to be here or to watch online next week as well. But this afternoon, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Robert Adam. And indeed, we could have no better, I think, person to launch our uh, third sequence of seminars. Uh, Bob, and you'll note when he comes into frame that he and I are wearing the uniform, it seems, uh, as well. Yeah, maybe by yours. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, actually, it's, it's, it's my fault, because I think when we had dinner last night, you were wearing a similar suit, so I probably shouldn't have chosen this one today. But there we go, uh, such is the fortune of life. These things happen with time, Bob, things happen with time. Uh, so um, uh, Bob uh, will be well known to many people as uh, one of the great leading architects working in the traditional and classical idiom in the second uh, half of the well, last third, let's say, of the 20th century and into the first two decades of the 21st century. He was the principal in Robert Adam Architects, uh, now Adam Architecture. He now runs his own consultancy. Um, and uh, also, uh, apart from being the author of uh, numerous very important and good buildings, uh, Bob found time to be on the council of the RIPA, the Royal Institute of British Architects. Indeed, he was the honorary secretary of the uh, RIBA for a number of years and in that position he used his position to create the traditional architecture group within the RIBA, a very important moment I think in encouraging the institute to be more catholic in its view of what architecture might and could be in the 21st century. Even before that Bob had founded INTBAU, the International Network of Buildings, Architecture and Urbanism. It's got a rather wonderful sort of Bauhaus name to it. But, yes, and it's uh, unfortunate. We tried to change it, but we couldn't. But it's, 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 a, good, it's a good acronym. Uh, again, a very important international uh, institution that's doing good work, I think, in, in rethinking what uh, buildings and built, and, uh, and a built environment in cities could be. Bob also found time, I don't know quite how, but he has found time to profess architecture as well as to do architecture. Uh, he's the author of uh, many books, actually, including a handbook of classical architecture uh, and also a visiting professor at the University of Stratford Clyde. Today, he's going to be talking to us about his new book, uh, very recently published. You see it on the screen here now, Time for Architecture. And so, um, Bob, we're all agog to hear your views on time for architecture. And I'd like to hand the floor over to you and you're very welcome. Uh, thank, thank you for you. coming to speak to us. Of course, I want everyone to rush out and buy the book um, because, you know, in the end, all you really want to do is sell books. But um, uh, this is a sort of gallop through a lot of the things that I, I've covered in the book. So I shall, without any more ado, I shall press on. Um, of course, it's about time and um, we're all very conscious of time because when, when, what we know that all one day our time will end uh, and it began and you can decide where you are on the section at the top. I'm sort of somewhere towards the right. Um, and this is, you know, the, the fact that, that, that we only have a limited time on this earth is one of the great neuroses of, of mankind. Um, it, it affects everything we do absolutely inevitably. And if it does, it affects architecture and urban design. It simply can't do anything else. But of course, um, what if it just goes on forever? Wouldn't this be fantastic? The seductive allure of timelessness. Well, the seductive allure of timelessness is, I mean, uh, and I tread on dangerous territory here, is one of course the great things about religion. Um, here we have um, the idea in Christianity where heaven actually looks rather boring and hell looks more interesting. Um, and um, we have Anubis there uh, measuring the, the heart of the dead person to decide whether they're going to go for eternal life or not. And a great deal of religion is based on the principle um, of, of, of actually living beyond your own death. Uh, I'll leave that subject briefly, it's a depressing subject, but However, the idea of timelessness has become a, a kind of standard um, uh, 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 expression of praise for a number of things, including architecture. Now, here are two architects whose work has been described as timeless. Um, one is Michael Graves and the other is Toyo Ito. I mean, I could have picked many others, but then, uh, uh, I, you can now collect a number of times 
that people's work is described as timeless. Um, uh, a number of people have, um, uh, this, this has got a long history, of course, in terms of architecture, um, fusing with the idea that, 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 that the Gothic in some way was, was closely related to a, 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 a timeless um, aspect of heaven. As, uh, the Gothic architecture was closely associated with Christianity um, and Saint-Denis, the ambulatory, which was associated with um, a, a, a panoply of saints, uh, or the idea somehow um, um, the Vitruvian idea of the Vitruvian man. The interesting thing about proportion, um, often one's criticized when one's buildings not being in proportion, believe me, this happens all the time. I always say, well, which particular proportion are you referring to? Because all buildings have proportion, it's just a question of which ones. Um, and of course, the key issue, one of the key issues in this, uh, brief about this, is that a lot of people believe that either um, uh, man was made in the image of God or gods. Therefore, any proportions you found in man which were appeared to be universal were therefore a representation of a deity. So that idea even of, of proportions came into timelessness. And also the idea that classical architecture in itself is timeless, um, but and this is this is Serlier's first um, display of the five orders, which of course is rather different from the five from those five orders that existed before. So the idea of this being timeless again is slightly questionable. As a class, as someone who does classical architecture, I say this. Uh, actually, it moves on with time, just like everything else. So we're kind of you know, if we believe this that everything moves on and changes, we're kind of stuck because people really want to get some, a fix on something because they can say, ah, this is now timeless. And what, one of the ones that's left is the golden section, um, which has been put to various uses. Um, uh, and um, I got that one off the internet actually on Trump. I mean, if you put in golden section, you can't have fun, you know, and then go to Google images. Um, and um, quite what uh, the Mona Lisa's right wrist has got to do with her nose, I'm not entirely sure, but clearly, the idea was that when it was painted, that was what they were really thinking about. And the one with the Taj Mahal, if you move um, three steps further forward, that disappears. But the interesting thing is that the first time that the golden section was mentioned by any architects, has been directly connected with architect, was Adolf Zeising in 1854. But if you read about it, people will tell you they used it on the pyramids, they used it on the Parthenon. It's all a question of which molding you choose. I'm deeply skeptical of this, I have to say. It's fine. Everyone uses proportions and uses the golden sex has fantastic qualities, as does a root two rectangle, which we do know was used. Um, um, if people want to use proportions, that's fine. And they have great qualities and so on and so on. But unfortunately, they're very easy to discover if you choose very carefully the molding that you use. Um, in fact, the three, four, right, three to five rectangle, whole number rectangle is so close visually to the golden section that when people demonstrate this on diagrams, is how did you know it wasn't a three, five section? Normal answer is, oh, that's one of the Fibonacci series. My said, so is one, two. You know, so anyway, I, I won't bang on about this, but I upset lots of people saying this. Um, so um, timelessness, I, I kind of dismiss because actually, in my opinion, there's, there's no such thing. Um, uh, it, 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 something might last for a very long time, or did it exist before, um, before Homo sapiens emerged? If it didn't exist before Homo sapiens emerged, it clearly is not timeless because it actually goes back. So. We get on to what is time, and that, of course, would be a many lectures all on its own. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll briefly pass by this one. This is, um, um, I mean, the, the idea that actually time began with the Big Bang 38 billion years ago, plus or minus 21 million. Possibly it did. The idea that time began then, there's people like Lee Smolian that say that actually that time is the only constant. So there's a whole debate about this in terms of you know, mega time or maximum time. And the other one is, is, um, is entropy, which says everything gradually decays. Um, but there's also uh, particle physics, which, which actually some of the particle physics apparently operate uh, in, uh, in, can move backwards or forwards. And I won't, I'm not gonna just dwell on this very briefly because we're not gonna talk about it anymore, but just to show that I've covered it. Um, that um, uh, uh, the whole thing about um, uh, quantum entanglement is actually possibly going to solve the problem of particle physics and the fact that things that actually particles can actually move backwards and forwards in time. So that takes us, you know, not, um, to actually much more um, uh, important subject is phenomenology. Um, here am I having a phenomenal time with the column. Um, and um, this means you've got to read Martin Heidegger, which I wouldn't particularly recommend. Um, but um, unfortunately, I had to. But actually, the, the key thing about Heidegger is that you go back to the things themselves. 
And actually in architecture, that's what we're dealing with. So it is actually the things themselves. And the thing about uh, this also, it also will never to be deal with memory and how we deal with things themselves, which is from the past. I, I use this as, as a kind of general illustration um, uh, is that, you know, basically there, there is only the present. It just in essential philosophical terms, which is an infinitesimal moment. It's slightly more than that, which I'll get to. Because if, if the present is an infinitesimal moment, which simply divides up the past and the future, I mean, what I said a moment ago is now the past, um, uh, then we've only got the past, there isn't anything else. Um, obviously, we have to use the past in order to project ourselves into the future, because that's what we have to do. You have to do that across the road, you have to do almost everything. And um, to, in order to deal with the past, of course, you have to deal with memory. Uh, and I, I've just used these pictures of towns as a sort of as a sort of model for this, is that for neurological studies, that memory is not some um, videotape that you run backwards. People use these analogies. It seems that what you do is that you pull things from different parts of your brain to reassemble a memory. And every time you do that, that makes another memory. So actually, memory in itself is not static. And this is why people, you know, in jurisprudence, this is a really tricky issue about what people remember. So rather like these towns, which are one place, but in fact, they are a whole series, they're a jumble of, of, of things that go up to make the place. So that's why I use it as a model. But of course, we do have to predict ourselves into the future in order to exist. And architects are keep claiming we are for the future, therefore we're different from everybody else. Every architect's for the future, because there's nothing else you can do. You can't, you can't be for the past. So um, of course, that takes us the interesting thing about science fiction. Uh, and this is a slight aside, and if you want to, well, when, you, when you get to read my book, you'll see my little piece on this, but it's actually very interesting because science fiction runs a very close parallel to modernism, but it's a hard lecture. But the thing about science fiction is you always know when the science fiction was produced and um, when you look back at it, because it's, it, it, it clearly represents the time at which it was produced. And all the science fiction has moved from being a kind of pulp fiction thing in the pre-war period to being a, an academic study. Um, and in fact, Liverpool, which is one of the uh, universities, one of the main schools of this. And um, uh, so it's interesting to look at these. So the top left, we have some looks like remarkably like La Défense. Um, and, and clearly the, the future, the, the uh, city of the future, that was clearly done in the 30s. And as this one was done in, in, in the early 20th century, um, where um, I don't think anyone wore clothing like that um, later on. But the best one, my favorite one, is the Smithson's House of the Future, which was this is in 1956. This is what it was going to be like in 1981. I think we had a lucky escape. Um, most of the architectural pictures don't show the figures um, with this bizarre, chunky knit tights. But you'll notice that the woman's doing the cooking and the man's reading the newspaper. So they, they were clearly locked in, in, in 1956 in that respect. Um, and um, the two interesting theories have come up about, well, interesting theory about, about a science fiction. Uh, this comes from P.J. Dick, the, the uh, great producer, and also Darko Subin, one of the principal academics, is that science fiction has two key characteristics. One thing which Darko Subin called novel and the new thing, and disjunction is the, the, the shock of disrecognition, the two key things. Interestingly, uh, I mean, this actually is very close parallel to what, what, what modernism seeks to do. Um, and and the, the, the shock of disrecognition comes from Brechtian um, uh, theatre um, theory. So, we, you know, we, the, the, the key issue with, with this is that, um, and I've used this as a, a sort of diagram, is that um, uh, basically the novum, the new thing, or nova, the plural, it's not new for very long. Um, and so things that, you know, we want to shock or interest, and so on and so on, they just pass in, they're going to pass very quickly and they become familiar. I mean, that's just the way it is. And um, so in you know, the Villa Savoy, we, we're used to this now. This I'm sure was extraordinarily dramatic and, and at the time, but not really anymore, or the Schroeder House in, in Utrecht. So um, basically, as things move on, I just done this diagram as relevant events, as relevant events move on, um, the novum ceases to be the novum. And that's, uh, and that's definitely the case. So the idea that you're producing something to shock or, or to be deliberately new goes very quickly. You do it, I don't know if you do it, but that, you must realize that. So that little thing on, on how time works, how we perceive it. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, this, is, this is Fernand Bardell, that the, um, uh, uh, the Annalise, it's, it's change in time. Change in time is the same thing, basically. If nothing changed, there wouldn't be any time. 
And if you didn't, if you didn't see anything change, you wouldn't perceive time. Um, so, of course, different, um, a different um, uh, animals, for example, must have a different perception of time. I mean, a mayfly has only got five minutes. Um, so it doesn't even have a digestive system because there's no point. Um, so, uh, but no doubt a, a, a tortoise, were, a Galapagos tortoise, were it to have consciousness, which it may have, who knows, will have a very different perception of time, as indeed will the elephant there with the mouse on its trunk, which has five years and 50 years. So our perception of, of time is relative to how we, <clears throat> is relative to pieces of time, and they move at different rates. And here's, here's a, and again, as, as, as Braudel, Evenement, Conjuncteur, and Long Durée. And Long Durée, of course, commonly used now, but this is a geographical theory about the Mediterranean, is there, there, were, uh, there were events which were short, moved very quickly, conjunctures which, which joined these things together, and there was long time, which was geographic time. And that's clearly is, you know, this, once you understand that if time has changed, if things change at different rates, then clearly time will move at different paces. We've only turned this into a sort of scientific evenness uh, more, more relatively recently. A moderately useful concept is that, uh, of course, this is very important in economics, and we will be thinking about this right now as all our investments go through the floor, um, is that we do have things called economic cycles, um, and, and these things go up and down. It's non-linear time, as time is moving at this different rate. Also, interestingly, one I've used is Everett Rogers here at the bottom is the, diff the, the diffusion of innovations. It's very useful. I mean, A, it's a Gaussian curve, which is always useful because they look impressive. And, um, but it's, it's used in a number of ways. And he used this, this, this um, Gaussian curve to say to actually a, a very important work, actually, diffusion of innovations is how innovations have early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. So basically, things rise and fall. They just do. Quite useful to apply this to, to architecture. Um, and um, here I, I've actually tried to put this onto postmodernism, um, and um, postmodernism is a nice, neat sort of historical phenomenon that had a beginning and sort of had it dribbled off towards the end. Um, and also that looking at modernism, postmodernism, and putting these in other contexts where you actually look at cohorts uh, and you look at the economics and you start to be able to trace these 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 um, these patterns. Uh, it's just a it's just a useful technique um, for understanding and describing um, how architecture is. It's, it's slightly different from the Charles Jenks sort of moving blob, um, but um, it is actually quite useful. And in postmodernism, it's you know it's there, there we are. We have you know the, the, the sort of Dubai. They're still doing it in the Middle East, and really it possibly started in the late sixties, early seventies with um, Venturi. All debatable. But nonetheless, I think that's a, a reasonable way of dealing with architectural history. Uh, but variable time is also useful in terms of urban design. Um, uh, so if we uh, the, the, the urban geographer, M.R.G. Konzen, came up with a very similar concept to Bradell. I, I, I'm sure they knew, one another, they knew of one another, um, where he had a town plan, uh, building fabric, land and building utilization. Do these things moved at different paces? And clearly they do. Um, and we've got plan building function. Uh, and in urban design terms, this is, this is very, in my point, very important and very useful because the things that last, I, my, my saying for this in urban design is the things that last longest matter most. So geography matters a lot. Um, and actually urban form lasts from last millennia. Uh, buildings turn over moderately quickly and functions very often very much more quickly. Um, this is a, a, a useful discipline we're dealing with urban design because this is why architects are sometimes very bad at urban design because they, they start with function building in place, generally speaking, that's a bit of an overstatement, but an urban designer should start the other way around. They should look at the geography, the urban structure, and knowing the buildings will change, and particularly important, knowing the functions will change, which is very current. Um, and um, you, you can apply this. I mean, this is, uh, this is, this is a diagram um, from Stuart Brand um, uh, uh, and how buildings learn which he actually was a friend of Frank Duffy, who came up with, um, with this, uh, this idea, that particularly commercially, this is to do with changing office buildings, uh, is that, um, I mean, I think Stuart Brand tried to, he found of alliteration, so everything had to begin with S. Um, so stuff is actually sort of furniture and things, just so you know. Um, so the idea, all of these things move at different paces. And in terms of commercial buildings, this was a, a very important piece of work. Um, and Frank Duffy's work on this is, and Stuart Brand knew Frank Duffy very well. Frank Duffy, unfortunately, has serious dementia is in a home. Um, but um, so, you know, uh, just to kind of illustrate it, there's, there's a Peter Semery and Cardross talking about function. Um, 
uh, um, uh, by George, George, uh, Gillespie, Kim, well, very important more than this building, 1966, it closed in 1970, because the function actually um, ceased, and it's now a bit of a ruin, which is unfortunate. Or well, the Hancock building at Hancock Tower in Boston, um, which dropped bits of its stuff on the pavement, um, a killing, but then it actually killed everybody, but everyone was very nervous about it. Um, so I mean, this is, uh, you, can actually, you can actually put the Conzen and the, um, uh, uh, the, the Stuart Brand, Frank Duffy things together and, and come up with a, a slow and fast, well, I think is a very useful thing, both for urban design um, and for architecture. Uh, and this actually goes right through to sustainability. I mean, not right now, uh, being reusable, uh, uh, retrofit is one of the big issues. And this is very, this is important because if, you know, it basically, if you move down, uh, if you get to sort of building structure and building skin, uh, but the rest of the things can change, it's very important that the building structure and the building skin can actually operate, uh, can, can offer different functions at different times. A building which is unifunctional means you've probably got to replace it when the function changes, which is inherently unsustainable. This, I mean, by, in my opinion, this is, this is, this is you know, in the current climate, of, 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 this is very important. So that's variable time. Um, I go to my next one, which is, is, of course, one of the things we are constantly preoccupied with is, is being modern. And uh, again, this is another interesting adjective, um, rather like timeless, which gets bandied around um, uh, all the time. Uh, uh, not very analytically, in my opinion, which, of course, I would say that because I've analysed it. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, what it, what is modern? So here we have um, uh, Bristol City Hall produced around about the same time as Ronchon. I mean, or George Samuel Smith's house um, um, built at the same time as Seattle Public Library. Now, clearly, in any temporal sense, uh, if, mo if modernity means what it does to a lot of people, actually, is right now, then they're all modern. But of course, we don't say that because we use the modern in a rather um, indistinct and Catholic way, and in a way that actually is, is misleading. Uh, and when you read my book, you'll read much more analysis of this, of course, but I only have time to summarize it. Uh, I've kind of got together about uh, um, seven different ways of saying modernity, of, of using the word modernity, um, modern history. We can slightly put that to one side. That's kind of post Renaissance. It's a you know, um, past modernity. Well, you can't have post modernity unless you've got past modernity. And you've got simple modernity. That's kind of what everyone think, you know, uh, there's interesting stories about this. People research modernity and they don't understand that for a lot of people out there who don't think about these things a lot, and why should they, uh, that simple modernity just means what you do now. Ordinary modernity, which I'll talk about, then there's modernism, which is a very specific attitude to modernity, and then it's predictive modernity, modernity is the future, which is subsets of modernism. To, to try and analyze this, I used uh, William James's uh, specious present. Um, William James, a philosopher, but had this basic concept that, that for, for um, uh, a very basic philosophical issue from Augustine and, and so on is that, is that you know, the present is an infinitesimal moving moment. Um, but William James said, well, yes, but the thing called the specious present, which is music is an analogy, is you can't really appreciate music unless you remember the last note and predict the next note. So he had this thing called the specious present, which lasted a few seconds. Um, a lot other philosophers have said, this is not, this is a specious theory. There are present events and of the, the present moment. Um, that's fair enough. I, I've expanded it in, in, in a form of present events as a species present, is that there is a, a, a present moment, but then with the present moment is, um, is, is what's been happening recently in order for you to project things into future. And that's roughly what I've called it. So, you know, the, the um, uh, um, civil war in Syria is a present event that hasn't ended. Um, but we call it a present event and it will end. And when it ends, it becomes a past event. It's just a, a useful way of analyzing. And I've given it as a kind of blobby diagram. But um, then I've, I've kind of said, well, what, you know, what chunk of this present event do each one of these definitions follow? And so ordinary modernity, I've kind of said, well, okay, it kind of, it, ordinary modernity, I'll get to what that is in a minute. It, it kind of sits in the middle of that. Um, uh, modernism is very specifically sits at, 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 a, at a very present moment, a recent past moment, um, and futurism kind of nudges that on. It's just a, a useful way of uh, describing the various versions. Um, so ordinary modernity is an interesting one, um, actually brought up by uh, uh, Peter Taylor's a geographer. So ordinary modernity is not everything that's happening now, it's something that's typical of now. So living in a suburb is typical of now, 
um, but wasn't invented now, but it's a typical thing of now. It's just a, another use of it. It's unlike simple modernity. Um, and then there is um, modernism uh, and, and the idea of the, of the, of the future that actually, of course, in architects will commonly say, I'm building for the future, as I mentioned before. Well, of course they are. You don't have an option, you know. <laughs> you know uh, what else can you do? Um, uh, and and, and um, Norman Foster has a, I'm, I'm optimistic. In other words, everyone else is pessimistic. Uh, and so on and so on. This is one of these sort of catchphrases that they use. Um, and uh, as we said about earlier on, you know, that, that all of our projections into the future are internally locked in the present or, or the present moment, or for that matter, the past. And science fiction is a very good illustration of this. So I illustrate two pictures of Naom in, in, in Saudi Arabia, the currently this, this uh, and the illustrations have a remarkable science fiction quality. Um, and um, so the relationship between how we project ourselves into the future. Now, no doubt, I have absolutely no doubt in 50 years time, people will look at this rather like we did of the one from the 1930s and say, well, you know, come on guys, you know, it wasn't like that. Because the only thing we know for sure about the future is we don't know what it is. Um, and also they're all, it's full of all kinds of surprises as we know um, in, uh, in our current political situation. Um, and in a, in a, so um, uh, if, uh, if uh, when people say, oh, well, this is for the future, I say, well, if you know what the future is, can you tell me? Because I'll put it on the 410 at Utoxeter. I'll be a very rich person. <laughs> um, so basically, how, you know, in, in the end, how do we handle this relationship between the, the past, the present, and the future? We, the only way we can do it as human beings, the only thing we've got is memory. There isn't anything else. Uh, memory, treasury, and guardian of all things. It's always nice to quote um, ancient philosophers. Sounds impressive. And, um, uh, but clearly, that's what we've got. In the end, as human beings, you hopefully you all remember this um, when I finish speaking, and that's all you'll have of it, really. And, and then you'll, you, I hope you'll use this to project yourself into the future. Uh, and of course, we're very interested in memory um, because we want, to, we want to try and preserve moments. We want, you know, monuments are about making sure that we don't forget something. Um, and so we have the Arc de Triomphe, which actually served several regimes from 1810 to 1836, but it was definitely meant to represent the glory of the French state or the Republican state or the post-Republican state because they kept adding to it. And then in the middle, um, we have um, the, Sal the amendment to Stalingrad siege with the Rodina Vat Soviet, the motherland calls, uh, and just to get some idea of the scale, uh, those are people. Um, uh, so it's very important that, you rem that the siege of Stalingrad was remembered, and this, this is remembered. And of course, we're seeing this happen at the moment in, 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 in um, former Eastern Bloc states, where they're, they're deliberately removing the monuments of memory because uh, they don't want to remember. You can't help it, they happened, but they don't want to have this reminder. Or there's Eisenman's um, uh, Holocaust Memorial in, um, uh, in Berlin, uh, of course, everyone's because these other these other memorials are very literal. You know, that's that's Russian motherland, um, and, and this is a, a triumphal arch. Uh, in in, um, in all fairness to Peter Eisenman, said, everyone said, he said, "What does it mean?" He said, "I'm not going to tell you," um, but it could mean all sorts of things to all kinds of people. That's a perfectly fair comment, actually, because one thing about these things is that what we think about motherland, an enormous statue of motherland, called by the way, mother holding a big sword, which um, not a very nice mother, really. And um, uh, clearly our, our attitude to this will change as we look at it. But the idea of fixing things in memory is very, very important to us. Um, but of course, with a, the thing about remembering is, is, um, um, uh, is that um, uh, you, you, know, the, you, you, you have to forget, you, because basically you have to remember, in order to fill your memory up, you've got to forget things. And forgetting is also important. Um, and so we actually do it quite a bit. So, on the, on the left, we have um, a Casa del Fascio by Tarani, um, for showing its original purpose. Um, uh, and, but of course, because everyone rather liked it, um, of course, we decided to eliminate its previous. It's now called Palazzo Tarani. And generally speaking, in architecture books, you don't get the picture on the left, you get the picture on the right. Um, and so, actually, what we, we very selective, you know, so um, what, you know, we know we're very, very sort of sniffy about uh, Mussolini's. Um, Mussolini's uh, Eur and other monuments, um, because we want to cut because people think, oh, well, that's kind of nasty old classical stuff, but this is modernism. So really it was all right. So we changed the name and forget that bit. Or well, at the bottom, we have um, uh, San Cecilio in Albi, uh, built in 1282, very important, one of the largest brick buildings of its time and possibly ever 
um, actually was built to commemorate the slaughter of about one million Albigensians. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't actually see it in that way now. Uh, and of course, Norman Foster would really quite like us to forget the, pa the Palace of Peace and Reconciliation in Astana, uh, Kazakhstan, built for a dictator known for torturing his, um, torturing his opposition uh, and so on and so on. And um, generally speaking, uh, he doesn't like talking about this. So we want to, he wants us to forget, actually, the regime that did this. And the Palace of Peace and Reconciliation, of course, is hugely ironic. Um, so memory and forgetting kind of go together. And um, of course, we also know this from destruction. I mean, the, in, in architecture, the idea or the urban thing is, is that you destroy places to actually try and make people forget the civilization involved with them. So it's a very potent reminder of this. Carthage, you know, was, was destroyed in, in 140 BC, you know, to try and eliminate the Carthaginian. Uh, Hampi, uh, to this day, was, was one of the largest cities in the world at the time, destroyed in 1565. Um, or, or actually, Rubek, Rostov, uh, Rostov and Nuremberg bombed in 1940, which led to the Baedeker raids. Um, this was actually seen by Germany as a deliberate attack on German civilization at the time. And uh, we, we forget this, that actually that, um, in fact, it was questioned in Parliament as to whether our own bombing um, was not in fact um, a, a war crime trying to destroy civilization. Um, you know, we, the victor usually um, writes the history. And at Mostar Bridge, of course, very specifically destroyed. Um, in fact, in the Yugoslav War, you know, one of the things that were, were, were dangerous things for a Croatian building was to say this is an important piece of Croatian heritage because it was more likely to be destroyed. So the idea of, of, of destroying in order to forget, I think the, the, the ISIS or the, the, the Taliban, the, 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 these destructions are rather, uh, there's more to be written on. These are different because they're, they are, dist they're not, they, they would say they're trying to destroy something, but actually what they're doing, rather like the IRA bombs in the late 19th century, where they're picking on, they're actually solidifying the importance of the buildings by picking on them for their symbolic value. I mean, oddly enough, I think more people know about the Twin Towers now than, than, than did when these rather dull uh, rectangular buildings were built. Um, because of, the, of their symbolic value. So actually, I think there's a, a slightly different picture there. But that takes us to, um, to the issue um, of, of, of memory and forgetting is a whole big issue of, um, I'm just not moving forward. Mm, I can do it here. Oh, it frozen. There we are. Um, about, you know, to, how important it is to remember things in particular ways. And that you might, the idea you can only, it, because it's in the present, it has to be authentic. Um, and um, so we have this problem uh, with the idea that uh, we, it, we mustn't confuse our memory by producing something which could possibly be mistaken for something that's older. Um, this is an interesting subject, really, because if you look at the bottom, this is the Arch of Titus. That's how it was um, when it was found. That was by Piranesi. Um, but, the, but it was rebuilt by uh, 1821 by Giacomo Valadier. Um, and most people looking at this, I'm sure, don't know that this is actually a largely fake um, reproduction. Cleverly done, actually. The column capitals are slightly different, et cetera, et cetera. It fulfills that. Does it matter? Don't think so, really. We know this. Actually, this is now on the right-hand side. It's a very important piece of early 19th century um, conservation work. So it's an authentic piece of, 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 of that. Or, of course, um, um, Colonial Williamsburg, I'm sure lots of people go to Colonial Williamsburg and say, hey, hey guys, this is really what it was like, you know, um, you know, strange man riding up and down a tricorn hat, um, and so on, so on. Fairly imaginative reconstruction, or Warsaw, even more interesting, um, where, which was very, very carefully preserved. So the um, uh, thing about Warsaw is UNESCO gave it a, a, a prize, which went completely all against all the UNESCO things. They said, well, it's, it was rather special, but we're not going to give any more uh, awards for this kind of thing. So it's authentically inauthentic. Um, so I'm going to now finish off with, um, I think one of the key subjects um, is, is, is how we deal with memory and memory in the past is tradition. And actually quoting Gary Omar is quite good really in this context. So um, the whole issue about we move from authenticity and authenticity and tradition. Well, a lot of our traditions are not, well, how, how authentic are they? Interesting thing about traditions is that um, they're very much to do with community identity. Um, you know, that the fact that I'm speaking to you in English is, is, is actually English, language being a prime tradition, is that um, you can hear the way I speak, uh, and that will, get, that will put me into a particular social place. 
and it'll put me in a particular national place. It's one of our key traditions and they, they permeate all aspects of our lives. It's very interesting how key ceremonies um, uh, uh, are often preserved these traditions for much longer. The Japanese one is very interesting, it's the man in a tailcoat, which is, which is something that um, Japan picked up at the end of the 19th century from its uh, opening up. But of course, the, the, the actual the Indian wedding, um, these traditions are um, built. So in the middle, we have Black Rod um, beating on the, the, the doors of Parliament to be let in, uh, a very specific tradition to do with the role of the monarchy in Parliament. Christmas tree introduced into Britain by Prince Albert because it, uh, it was a German tradition which has now been totally absorbed, I mean, absolutely everywhere. Um, or on the right, I'm not very sure what um, uh, European academic clothes have got to do with Chinese universities. I don't know why they don't wear, I mean, actually scholars in China had a very specific gown that they wore. Um, they've kind of expropriated that. In fact, it's, it's 17th century clerical wear. Uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so, um, when our tradition is authentic, because the great thing that, that Hugh Trevor Roper and, and Holtzwarm kind of poured scorn on these traditions as being all fake and meant to manipulate people, um, and particularly Holtzwarm, who was seriously left wing, it was a kind of establishment way of manipulating people, unless it was a trade union one, of course, in which case it wasn't. Um, but of course, we invent traditions all the time. Now, this is the festival of San Fermin in Pamplona on the top, where it had been going since the Middle Ages, but uh, the, the, the um, fireworks and scarves the Chubinato was actually edited in 1941. So you can carry on adding things to traditions and they just become absorbed within it. Or the kilt, uh, who Trevor Roper kind of poured, poured scorn on it because we know that the kilt in its present form was, and tartans were invented by an Englishman in the early 19th century. But it doesn't matter because they become a symbol of Scottishness from people who would never have been Highland tribesmen. Um, but now they wear them now because it's a symbol of Scottishness, particularly when you go on football matches. So in order to test this, um, I actually tried to find traditions. So what, what makes a tradition function and what doesn't? And I, I, I realized that actually it was having a convincing ancestry. So I found one that didn't work. On the left-hand side, we have 1970. We have um, um, uh, the White House Guard, which in President Nixon being much more successful with his foreign policy, his home policy, um, decided that these uniforms were boring. So he hired a, a costume designer to make up a uniform. And everyone laughed at it so much, it was quietly withdrawn. I think it was bought by the second Ohio marching band in the end. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, the thing was, it had no historical resonance. Uh, but, the, you know, um, West Point has, a, has a, uh, a, a uniform that they wear, which is, has a genuine historical resonance. Uh, it's like problem in America, is when, you get, when you go um, around the Civil War, you have a problem with whose side you're on. But the, is it one on the right? This is the European Court of Human Rights, uh, 1959. But notice they're wearing clerical wear, um, 17th century clerical wear. And, and they may be grinning, but they're not laughing at their clothing. Um, but the reason is, of course, this, although it's entirely made up tradition, kind of Belgian judge wear, um, then that actually, uh, the point was it has a, a resonance, it has an historical resonance, so it's okay. So um, we deal with this all the time. Here's the um, Fête Nationale Bastille Day, which only was in instituted in 1870, not 1878 around about nearly 100 years after Bastille Day, or the Tollpuddle Martyrs Festival, which they only were called Martyrs in 1930. The Tollpuddle um, uh, Unionists were, were transported in 1834. So we do this all the time. So, I mean, traditions are kind of fundamental, I think, to our, to our society and the way we operate. So it, it's foolish to, to, to pour scorn on them. And I'm going to finish off with what I consider to be some sort of reasonable sort of you know, categories or... or, 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 or what, what traditions actually need in order to function as traditions. They need ancestry. Um, I put in brackets convincing because the ancestry doesn't have to be real as we pointed out, it just has to be convincing. And so we, here we have um, uh, a very huge Palladio, interesting in this case, who actually, may, actually believed that Roman houses had, had temple fronts on them and they didn't. Um, but nonetheless, that was a convincing piece of, um, uh, which is now passed into that ancestry of the portico was kind of passed into. When I design big houses, which I do from time to time, um, I, I sometimes give the more people alternatives, you know, I give them a neoclassical one and so on and so on. And they always pick the one with the portico. Um, it's obviously very important. Or Fisherman's Bastion, 1902, a piece of kind of arts and crafts um, thing, which, where its ancestry, it's a, it's a kind of medievalizing ancestry. Um, or for that matter, the George Samuel Smith's um, 
uh, a gallery in, in, in Bond Street, again, that with classicism is a tradition which has an ancestry. We know this very well. I would add the point about traditions, of course, you can continue to modify them. What you've got to do is to retain that ancestry. But these are about traditional buildings. Traditional, they're not, traditional buildings are not alone in this. Um, here we have Bin House and Ho Chi Minh City on the top left and the Bauhaus Master's House. Now, I'm perfectly clear that, that um, Vo Trong Nga, I haven't pronounced his um, Vietnamese names, um, uh, was, would have been aware of things like the Bauhaus Master's House when he did this. So this is basically this, you know, more than 100 years earlier. So this, this basically, this has an ancestry. So this operates as a tradition, equal well, the Maersk Tower by Muller Architects. Uh, I, mean, I mean, they are bound to have known about Mies van der Rohe's fugitive um, project. So the, the, actually this kind of modernism actually uh, has, exactly the, has exactly the same criteria built into it. I'm not claiming tradition for those who just claim to be traditional. I'm saying that tradition is a fundamental aspect of the way we work. So ancestry applies in both cases. Um, the other one's community identity. Um, on, on the top is, is uh, actually that's in Nottingham and a suburb in Nottingham on the left. And you'll look very carefully, you can see it's kind of brick drill hall behind. So this architecture is clearly, is clearly specifically picks up on the Hindu identity of a large number of people in this part of Nottingham. So the architecture specifically expresses that. And here was Duncan Stroik's Thomas Aquinas College Chapel in, in Santa Paula, California, 2009. This very clearly picks up uh, uh, the, the identity of the Catholic Church with certain particular um, Catholic buildings. So this is how these are, these are signals of community identity. As indeed are these. Um, uh, here is um, actually the, the bottom is the key building is, is, is uh, the um, uh, Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion. In fact, the one you're seeing is a fake. It was built in 1986, um, but because uh, it got demolished very quickly. Uh, and um, actually it's quite, quite difficult to find the original photographs it was specifically lined up with a series of Corinthian columns, but we don't want to talk about that. But anyone, all of these other buildings, so we have um, Snug Architects, a, a project on the top left, Richard Horden's 1970 house is now listed on the top right, Farnsworth House, 1945, and recent one is Bach with two roofs, and in, in, which all of these have won awards, with the exception of the one that hasn't been built yet. Now, if you're an architect, you know very, you, this is a very clear identity signal. You know, this, you, anyone producing one of the buildings on the top is they immediately will recognize that they're part of the community of people that hold the Barcelona Pavilion as a key building, for that matter, the Farnsworth House as a key building. So these are very clear identity signals for an architectural community. So that's the second one. The third one is being identifiable. I, mean, not, I, I once had a conversation um, um, uh, uh, with another architect. So I do traditions too, but they're secret. I said, they can't be secret, they're not traditions. Um, so, but also the things you identify. So on the left, it's built by Hugh Petter, which was built for Duchy of Cornwall, and it has got on it Duchy of Cornwall's, um, the, the, king, the, the, the then Prince of Wales' feathers, which the new Prince of Wales' feathers as well, and also uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the um, ashes, the, uh, the giant versions of the, um, the ashes. And then the right, actually, I, I, I hesitate to put my own buildings in my own lectures. Um, there's a building I did in Beirut, I think it's still there. Um, where the, um, some of the, 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 basically the iconography of the various parts of this building are very specifically related to um, the, the Lebanese, Lebanese architecture, Lebanese Parsons community, but clearly a new building. But exactly the same thing happens um, here. So here we have, uh, it, this is, um, these are clearly identifiable and very specifically identifiable in Nanjing Youth Cultural Center, Bazaar ID, and Iku House in Tokyo. I mean, you, these are clearly clearly represent a particular type of architecture. So they are very clearly identifiable. There's no ambiguity about this. So I conclude with this really is that, is that tradition is, is uh, it's part of the way we deal with time, of course, a key way we deal with time and community, but it gives us another critical way to look. So if community is important, I mean, community obviously is important. If community is important, and what my definition is broadly correct, um, then to, to which community are we addressing these things? I mean, um, now we can debate about the other traditions as to which we live, but what's very clear is that, is that the architectural community, and it is a community, it's a community of people, um, they teach themselves to be in a community, they operate in the community, and they have traditions which identify, which are self identify as a community. Nothing wrong with that, that's what people do. But the issue is so you, you can't say you, you can't identify with your community. The issue is to which community you're addressing. If you're not addressing the bigger community, well, that's up to you. 
um, if you're not addressing a bigger community, but it is a, a critical basis. Who are you designing the buildings for? Are you designing for other architects or are you designing for another community? If you design for another community, you need to have convincing ancestry. Uh, you, you need to identify the community specifically and they have to be able to identify it as being part of their community. So there we are. That's where the whole issue of um, time took me to be lots of different places from science fiction um, to particle physics um, to um, Donald Trump's hairstyle. Um, and there's much more in the book. So um, believe me, uh, but that's just a, a gallop through what I thought might be some of the more interesting points. So thank you very much.